Welcome to my Soul Series. Soul Series is part of Oprah and Friends, exclusively on XM Radio Channel 156. And you can listen to the entire Soul Series collection on XMRadio.com slash Oprah. I was fascinated by this story. It's one of the most violent prisons in southern Alabama offered an experimental program to harden criminals for 10 days, murderers, drug dealers, men who will spend most of their lives locked up, dedicated themselves to a controversial intensive meditation program. Yes, that's right, prisoners meditating. The goal was to help them live peacefully behind bars and become free from their own minds. The results? Well, wait till you hear what happened. My guests are filmmaker Jenny Phillips, who captured this story in her book and documentary, and we'll talk with two prisoners who went through the program and still remain behind bars for life, but feel freer than they ever have in their whole lives. Meditation in prison. This is going to be interesting, so join us. It's uplifting, enlightening, truly powerful. Welcome to Soul Series. Welcome to my Soul Series. According to Eckhart Tolle, most people spend their entire life imprisoned within the confines of their own thoughts. You know, we've done a lot of talking about that with um, Eckhart Tolle for 10 weeks here online. So when I heard that one of the most violent prisons in southern Alabama was experimenting with an unprecedented treatment program designed to free the prisoners from the prisons of their own minds... Um, I was quite fascinated by that. There's transformative power, I know for sure, in prayer and also in meditation. And no matter how hopeless your circumstances are, I know that that power is always ours for the asking. And lest you think that you are the exception to that rule, I'm about to introduce you to a group of men whose stories may change the way you see yourself and the world around you. It's a very powerful story. These men are felons. Some have even murdered. Many will live the rest of their days in a violent, overcrowded, maximum security prison in Alabama. And I ask you, as you are listening to me right now, to think about what would you have to live for when um, today, tomorrow, next week, next year, offers you no chance of ever being free. I'm asking you also to put yourself in the shoes of a maximum security prisoner. How do you find solace behind bars? Why would you even want to live after you begin to grasp uh, the cruelty of what you've done to other people. So this story starts as the East meets the West in the Deep South. Imagine that. An author and documentarian, Jenny Phillips, delivers us the story by way of her book. Uh, I discovered this book this summer, and whenever I discover a book, you know, I like to share it with everybody. And this book is called Letters from the Dhamma Brothers. Dhamma being, being spelled D-H-A-M-M-A. Letters from the Dhamma Brothers. And her dramatic documentary, also called The Dhamma Brothers, East Meets the West in the Deep South. So happy to finally uh, be able to talk to you face to face. It's wonderful to be here with you. So how does a nice Massachusetts lady such as yourself <laughs> get herself uh, placed at a maximum security prison down in, down in Alabama? I'm a psychotherapist. I've been working uh, for many years in my psychotherapy practice and mm -hmm. um, uh, at one point decided that I kind of wanted to take what I do to the streets and work with another population. I live in Massachusetts near a, a medium security prison and about 12 years ago, I think, I went in and began uh, leading psychotherapy groups, teaching a uh, program called Houses of Healing, mm -hmm. which has a meditation component in mm -hmm. it. And since the first time I sat down with a group of prisoners, it's been um, an obsession of mine to, to work with them, but also to let the outside world know the truth of the matter, which is that this is a population, many of whom are highly motivated for change. Hmm. 
And were you just a regular citizen who said, gee, I want to do something and, you know, use myself, use my talents, and um, I choose to do that with prisoners, like some people choose to work with young children, some people choose to work with senior citizens, and you say, I want to go in, in, because you're drawn to the plight of the, the prisoners? Yeah, I, I just I wanted to contribute. I wanted to do something meaningful. Many years ago, I was uh, in the Peace Corps as, as a public health nurse in Southern Africa. And um, I just wanted to, as I say, get back to the streets again with some of the training that I've had as a cultural anthropologist and a psychotherapist, use my skills to work with an underserved population. I guess part of me would have loved to have gone to a third world country or gone to the Sudan and tried to contribute. But um, I found that right down the street from my own house was an underserved population. And um, I've worked with state and, and uh, county prisons in Massachusetts for about 12 years So you now. weren't afraid? You weren't scared? Not at all. Not not for, maybe for the first five seconds and never, really? never again. Because you are white and female, and most prisoners are filled with men who are uh, non-white and male. And... Um, most people consider that to be a threat because people are put behind bars because they have done uh, cruel and often horrible things to people. So there never was a moment of fear that you said... No, I, I discovered after five seconds that they were human beings mm -hmm. suffering greatly, um, bottled misery in inside prisons. And I, I've occasionally had a group where there was a guy who was just trying to stir things up and make trouble, and I've thrown this person out of the group. Mm -hmm. um, You've thrown him out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I tell him to get out. Okay, Jim. Um, but by and large, the people that show up for these groups, as I said, they're miserably unhappy. They're looking for a way to find some meaning in their lives, and they're willing to roll up their sleeves and work harder than you and I would ever work at anything because mm -hmm. their very lives uh, depend upon finding the meaning of their lives and how to turn things around. So I, I would imagine that most people's, and I, I would say, you know, I have, I'm making a general assumption as to how I assume the general public feels or thinks about prisoners. And I say that because you know, for many years I was a television reporter and oftentimes I would go into the prisons and, you know, do stories and would experience the same kind of thing you're talking about. That when you sit down face to face with people, even though they have done horrible things, you realize that that is something, that is an act that they uh, uh, presented against somebody, but that is not, that act does not have to be them. And, you know, I, I've always understood that, um, that you are not necessarily what you do. And because you do something in your life that's a horrible thing, that does not forever define who you are. But I would say that in general, the population, our, you know, American population has this idea of you you put them behind bars, you lock them up, and you throw away the key. And if you never hear from them again, that would be fine. Would you agree? I agree that most of the, pu uh, the public feels that way, and that's because they haven't had the experiences that you and I have had, and that's why I wanted to make the film, mm -hmm. and later why I why I wanted to publish the book, because I feel as if um, the the truth uh, would be wonderful for the public to understand, which is yeah. this is a population badly in need of treatment. I'm not, and most people are going to get out, and 97 percent of them are going to get out, and even the ones that aren't going to get out. When they're living in um, prison institutions, um, it would be a lot safer for the staff in there if people were receiving the treatment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, the question of why I went down to Alabama, it, and I want to just try to make it a, a short answer, is that um, I was doing research on the impact of teaching meditation to prisons, prisoners in Massachusetts. I heard about Donaldson Correctional Facility. I heard that a large number of prisoners were teaching themselves to meditate with some help from uh, the psychologist. And um, I was fascinated by that. I still don't understand exactly why I got on that plane and went down. I called the psychologist who was Dr. Kavanaugh at that point. Mm -hmm, he was mm -hmm. the prison psychologist. Dr. Ron Kavanaugh. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ron Kavanaugh. He said, come on down and, you know, talk talk to the groups. We can compare our groups down there. With what year the was this? When was this? That was 1999. Mm-hmm. I think it was November 1999. So you're teaching in Massachusetts. You call Dr. Kavanaugh. Dr. Kavanaugh says, come on down. We'll compare our groups. You go down to Donaldson uh, Prison in Alabama, and you find what there? 
Well, I found something not so different from up here, um, which is human beings uh, in great misery looking for solutions. But I had an incredible opportunity because Dr. Kavanaugh, I brought a tape recorder, of course, and Dr. Kavanaugh gave me his office and uh, brought me people to talk, brought me prisoners to talk this to. This is the prison and, psychologist? Yes, uh -huh. the prison psychologist. And I talked to these men at great length, tape recorded my um, sessions with them, Ask them what life was like in prison, what they were searching for, um, what they wanted, what would help them feel better about where they were. And um, I was so moved by these interviews. Some of the men that you uh, read their letters in the book or see them in the film, I met in 1999. Some of them mm -hmm. I didn't. But I, I never looked back once after that first visit to Alabama. And the book we're talking about is Letters from the Dama Brothers by Jenny Phillips. Yeah. Yes. So I, I just, I was so stirred by what I saw and heard that day. And um, I, I then, I saw a movie soon after that called um, Doing Time, Doing Vipassana. It's about a prison in which the warden decides that everybody needs to sit in meditation and she wants Vipassana to, is a kind of meditation. Yeah, it's an ancient uh, practice based directly on the teachings of Buddha 2,600 years ago. It's an mm. ancient, intensive, uh, it's not relaxation, it's not religion, it's a set of skills and techniques for addressing your inner um, issues. So it's not like transcendental meditation. How is it different from transcendental meditation? I'm not that familiar with transcendental meditation, but Vipassana outlines a program in which you sit for 10 days for 10 hours a day. Whoa. And so it's it's really um, boot camp of meditation with a lot of training and a lot of support. There are teachers there with you. These courses go on all over the world. They are, they are showing up in prisons in other parts of the world. Um, in the United States, until Donaldson um, decided to try this, this program, it had never been done in a state prison in the United States before. Wow. So the purpose of Vipassana med meditation is to still the mind, to make you more conscious, to bring a greater sense of awareness? What? Um, yes, th that's all true. I, I guess I want to say that it's really to help you take a journey inside, deeply inside of yourself hmm. and look at yourself. I don't know if you've ever heard the expression, um, the only way out is in. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hear it a lot in prisons because the prisoners understand they live in the most distracting and violent and um, uh, sad environment and they're looking for a way to get in. They, they often want to look at their crimes, they want to look at their pasts, mm -hmm. and they don't have the skills and techniques. And frankly, I want to say that um, prison treatment programs often don't get you to that level. They're on a very um, surface level. And I think uh, you really need to start with going deeply inside yourself to find out who you are at bottom, to look at things that you haven't thought about maybe since you were a child, um, and we, we don't offer the opportunity for prisoners to do that because they don't have a safe place and they don't have the skills to do it. You know, you've said that several times, and it's very interesting because as I listen to you, I fully understand what you're saying, but I also listen as my listeners and viewers, and I know what they're thinking. They're thinking, so what if they're sad? So what if they're in an unsafe environment? So what if, you know, they, you know, aren't, don't have a chance to look deeply inside themselves? They've, they've done harm to society, often done, you know, terrible things, in for murder, in for life. So what the hell do we care if they're safe and feeling all good about themselves? Yeah. Why, should, why, why, do I, why do we want that? Um, I don't think our society necessarily benefits from a, a whole subset of the population being absolutely miserable and out of control. But, but I you've used the word sad and you've used the word safe. Why should they be safe when they have done the ultimate in causing uh, uh, a great deal of the population to feel unsafe yeah. and to feel yeah. deep sadness yeah. and pain and grief and sorrow? Yeah. yeah. Well, as I say, I don't, I don't know if we as a society gain from having people be miserable, but if we do, uh, and, and I certainly don't know everything, maybe, maybe we should make prisoners be miserable, but our prisons, our prisons are not safe. Corrections officers are uh, suffering as much as the prisoners when they're in there because these environments are not feeling comfortable and mm -hmm. safe. Um, so I think uh, prison staffs would be more comfortable 
if their population were receiving some kind of treatment. But also the streets are going to be safe because, again, 97% of these people are going to be out in the streets again. And if you're only going to um, uh, sort of uh, make them more unhappy and isolate them and make them, you know, have low self-esteem and depression while they're there, and, and anger, lots of anger. When they get back into the streets again, they're going to recommit. And the recidivism rates that we have in our society yeah. are way too high. Yeah, I think that that's really the, the, the most difficult, to get people, the difficult thing to get people to understand, that if you continue to treat people like an animal because they have treated other people like animals, not even like animals, because animals don't kill for, for just because they can kill. Animals kill to uh, either protect themselves or because they need food. You know, we're the only animal that kills because we didn't like something that you did, or because you took my stuff, or whatever. Um, as human beings, we do that. But what I think people need to understand is what you were saying earlier, and I'm talking to Jenny Phillips, author of Letters from the Dahmer Brothers, that 97 percent of men who are in prison right now are one day going to be released. And if they are treated uh, like animals, if they're given no respect, given no sense of dignity, given no sense of uh, self-esteem or self-esteem building uh, to be able to feel like a human being, then they come back into the world and they commit more crimes that do the same thing. So it becomes a vicious cycle. So I hear what you're saying. Absolutely hear what you're saying. So when you went to this prison, why did, why is it called Dhamma? Dhamma is um, in the in the Buddhist language, which is called Pali, P A L I. Um, it meant the pathway to to wisdom. It later became a Sanskrit word and became the word Dharma, which everybody knows the word D H A R M A. Yeah. So these guys started calling themselves because this was their pathway. They were they had taken this journey into themselves. They started calling themselves the Dhamma Brothers. Mm -hmm. That's where the title of the film comes from. Letters from the Dhamma Brothers. So do it, when you first went into this prison, uh, was Dr. Cavanaugh, was he meditating with these guys? Was he were they doing any kind form of meditation? They were. They were there there was a program called Houses of Healing, which is the one I was teaching up in Massachusetts. It's it's a book called Houses of Healing that's in prisons all over the United States. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. part of it outlines a very uh, simple form of 15, 20 minute meditation. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Kavanaugh was um, setting up these groups and the men were, were learning to meditate from this book. Okay. And so when the idea of bringing this different form of Vipassana, the, the idea of bringing Vipassana into the Donaldson uh, Correction Center came from whom? Um, I guess it was my idea. I, I mentioned I saw the film, and I thought, this is what those guys were asking for in those interviews. They were asking me to take this journey inside. And this this program would provide them with that journey. And I immediately contacted the Vipassana Center in western Massachusetts in Shelburne Falls. And the teachers that you see in the film, Bruce and Jonathan, were at that center, and um, I struck up a conversation with them about, hey, there's this prison down in, in Alabama where the psychologist is interested in bringing the program down there. And wow. we started, that started a conversation that lasted until 2002 when we actually made, made it happen. It involved many stages and uh, levels of negotiations. You know, for one thing, we had to figure out some way for, according to Vipassana rules, the teachers live among the students during these 10 days. So we had to figure out some way for the meditation teachers to come in and live with the prisoners. Well, that's never happened before, I don't think, in, mm -hmm. in uh, prison that's history what I saw in the, the United film. States. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a wonderful architectural solution to that, which was over the gym where the meditation center was constructed, uh, a steep a little stairway up to a little room uh, with a little toilet and space to put down a sleeping bag. And every night the, the uh, officer on duty would lock the teachers into the um, into that little room and they would sit up there and they'd, they'd look down and they could see the prisoners down below to see what they were doing. But that architectural anomaly at Donaldson allowed this to take place. And when, when this program, I hope, will spread to other prisons, there's got to be some solution found to... Uh, safe housing for for the teachers because uh, you know what I read I read your book obviously and because uh, I don't talk to people without reading their books uh, but I read your book and as I was reading your book it seemed to me I had an epiphanal moment reading the book I go this is going to be the way of the future I mean it just seems to me to be 
the only uh, logical evolvement for our society. And it may not be in your lifetime, may not be in my lifetime, but for people to understand that what you put out into the world is going to come back, that, you know, that the law of cause and effect, and that we have to create a different cause in order to have a different effect, even with people who are incarcerated. And so this idea of going within yourself to find the true answers for your life, I think, is going to become more a part of our own society, people living on the outside of prisons, and certainly for people who are living on the inside of prison. I mean, eventually, this is going to be the way. It's either this way or we don't, we don't survive yeah. as a species. It's like um, Eckhart Tolle was saying in his book, A New Earth, uh, during one of our 10 sessions, that we have come to the point where we're going to either evolve or die as a society. And this seems like a part of that evolvement. Yeah. You know. I don't know if you know that expression, the, the world leader for the Vipassana community, Mr. Goenka, talks about world peace through inner peace. Mm -hmm. And and I really believe that if I can generate peace from within my own chest through through doing this inner work, then I can contribute to the peacefulness in the world. Yes, you mentioned the Vipassana Center where you brought these counselors from. So they teach Vipassana at a center and anybody who's listening to us right now could go to the center or you could find out how to do Vipassana meditation through working with the center. Absolutely. These centers are all over the world and um, um, when you go to one of these centers, uh, you, you have to register, of course, you don't just show up. But when, you, when you're accepted in a course, and nearly everybody would be, unless there were some severe psychiatric reasons why mm -hmm. you couldn't be, you will be housed and fed delicious, nutritious food, and these skills will be taught to you, and it doesn't cost a penny. This really? is all done through donations. Wow. These centers are really just serving humanity by bringing uh, this set of, of techniques. And Vipassana is spelled V-I-P-A-S-S-A-N-A. -S -S -A -A. Good. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> V-I-P-A-S-S-A-N-A, -S -S -A -A, Vipassana. And so anybody could do it. Yeah. Anybody could do it. Do you have to do it for 10 days? Because I think I'd read read or heard that sometimes you can do it for a shorter period. Well, I was thinking at first, oh, gee, I'd li like to do it. And then I saw the documentary and thought I wouldn't last. Yeah. This ten. particular lineage, um, which, again, it, it, well, it's 10 it's, days, 10 hours. Yeah. It, it turns into 11 days and it's Ooh. it's 100 hours of meditation. And this particular lineage really... Um, and, and we're talking uh, about people who had never meditated before. It, it, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you're listening and you're thinking about this is like, you're right, meditation boot camp. Yeah. yeah. But you're not left, uh, uh, you know, sitting on your mat for 100 hours alone without any help. You're very much integrated into... Um, you don't talk to other people. You don't listen to the radio. Sorry about that. But yeah. <laughs> you don't read books or watch TV or, or use the I telephone. Know. But... Because they want you to re be internally focused, but you're in uh, constant communication with the teacher when you when you uh, you know need guidance. Issues come up. You can imagine for the Dhamma brothers after having this stuff shut up inside of them for so many years, when they sat on those mats and things began to come up for them. And the film tells the stories of some of these guys as things come up for them. They would be overwhelmed. Um, yeah, there's I'm a story tell you where in the. You can get the film or see the film in a moment. Did, was, did, did I understand that the Dhamma brothers are or were some of the best students uh, the Vipassana teachers said they'd ever had? Why do you think that is? Well, the reason I think that is, um, Bruce and, and Jonathan, the teachers, wondered why are these guys working so hard so that unlike... Other by courses, working so hard, you mean um, uh, being so still, being able to sit there for ten yeah, hours. Yes. Okay. And and getting up from from a sitting and going and lying down and continuing to meditate or refusing to go and eat a meal because they wanted to continue to meditate. Um, and um, one one guy described it. One one guy whose letters are in the book, wonderful letters. Omar Rahman said that he felt he had to be a Navy SEAL about it. The reason is is because um, they're they're living in in prisons. They're cut off from the world. Um, you know, they, they feel like there's so little opportunity coming their way. Yeah. And here they have an opportunity. Here's this program rolling in, offering them the possibility to find out more about who they are at, at, at a deeper level. So here's this program that comes into your prison that says, 
we're going to let you uh, separate yourself from the rest of the prisoners. Yeah. For 10 days, we're going to create this. No visits, no me- no um, canteen, so no candy bars or Kansas soup or the normal distractions. You can't eat uh, any food that it, that comes from an animal or. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. So it all has to be healthy food. Uh, and you are separated from the rest of the prison population. And you sit on a mat and you meditate for 10 hours a day with with breaks in between with breaks there are more in between. than 10 hours in a day i mean you can imagine you get up after an hour and you go and and you have a meal or you use the bathroom or you go lie down for a while so that you you you're never there for long stretches of time it's fre- it's broken up hour mm-hmm. by hour Mm-hmm. So uh, for an hour at a time, and then yes. you go back, and then for another hour. At yeah. A time. And what would happen when you would see these, go- these men, start to first of all get still? You know, oftentimes, you know, I know, and we've talked about on 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 the Soul Series for the past couple of years that, you know, when you go within, that the answers that you find within yourself. You can only do that when you get still enough to quiet the outside world. What would happen when these men would first go inward and start to meditate? Um, they had extreme difficulty. Um, they just sitting still um, and you know feel, feeling the pain of, of what was right below the surface and about to come up. Um, you know, it was extremely difficult for them. The first three days, as outlined in Vipassana, you are simply focusing on the breath going in and out of the nose. Mm -hmm. And that's the focusing technique so that on the fourth day when you begin practicing Vipassana, which is letting your mind go throughout different parts of the body and focusing on the sensations in the body, you are really ready to do that. But the first three days of just just watching the air, feeling the air going in and out of the nose, um, when your mind, you have the monkey mind, and you're afraid of what's going to come up, you know, all this garbage. You know, one guy told me I was afraid of the garbage that was going to come up. People who had done things that they never wanted to think about again. Mm-hmm. They wanted to, but they wanted to in a, in a controlled way in which they knew that they could be safe. I mean, I just am, you know, as I was reading the book and also later watching the documentary, and I am a meditator, but I cannot even imagine what that would be like to do that for 10 hours for 10 days straight and also having you know done anything in my life that you feel really regretful for I mean the whole process of meditation you know on a regular basis let you get me I I don't I don't have any regrets about life so I can't imagine what happens if you have done something that required you to be behind bars and what kind of stuff comes up I mean it was amazing for me watching these grown big men, uh, often broken down into tears. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I really answered your question, Oprah, about why these guys work so hard, and I just wanted to emphasize again that they were willing to sacrifice everything in order to find... You know, because they're so miserably unhappy, and I think yeah. that that's an important key here, understanding why these guys actually have something to offer to us in the so-called free world. And I, when I decided to make this movie, I wanted to make a movie in which prisoners were the main characters. Mm-hmm. I think they be- can actually give us some spiritual guidance here because they're so miserably unhappy. In in some ways, I think it's like if, if you went to the streets of Baghdad right now and talked to a, a, a soldier, or if you went into a hospital where people were about to die of cancer, they would not be talking about trivia. They would be talking about the really fundamentally important things about about humanity and existence. Well, I understand it. I mean, I asked the question for the benefit of everybody who's watching or hearing us right now, but I understand why that they would be why they would be the best uh, students. Yeah, because when yeah. it is your last hope, mm-hmm. your last and only hope, right? Then you would try to seize that moment. You would yes. try to grasp and hold on to whatever was going to offer you some relief, right, from yourself. Right. right. Yeah. F- you know, you're looking for the for 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 a piece of freedom, a yeah. way to be, a way to be free. So I understand that. Yeah. I understand. And that. it's such hard work too that I think when somebody says, "Well, why do you want to be soft on prisoners? Why do they desire to? Why why do they deserve to 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 be happy?" Um, it, to work through this program is such difficult labor. It's it's so intense yeah. for them that uh, really, you know, it's they they've worked 
beyond the capacity. And that, so for everybody who's, who's, who's uh, all those of you who are watching right now and listening to us and you're saying, oh, so it's work to sit down and I wished I had 10 hours to sit with myself. Try doing it. Try doing it just for an hour. Just and keeping your mind, yeah. st- making your mind still for at least for, for five minutes. Most people can't even do it or for a five second. minutes. Or a second. Or a second. Can't even do it. Well, next week we're going to be joined by two of the Dhamma brothers who are uh, still in prison and will be in prison for a while. But they're going to join us by phone. So I look forward to being able to share that conversation. Thanks, Jenny. This was good. Great. Good I enjoyed it. You. Thank you. All right. I hope you enjoyed this edition of our Soul Series. These are some of my favorite conversations. To hear more, sign up for a free 30-day XM Radio trial by going to www.xmradio.com slash Oprah.